Hi, I'm Manly Hopkinson. Um, what do I do for a living? All sorts of different and exciting things. I'm a speaker. I'm a catalyst on cultural change, founder of the Compassion Leadership Academy. Um, I, I skip it in a race around the world, which was a profound moment in my life. And I'm sure I'll have an opportunity to share stories of that later on as well. I uh, did a race, the Magnetic North Pole. Both these incredible adventures taught me a couple of amazing things. One is I love a big adventures and I've got to do more. Uh, so welcome to the Inspiring Leadership Series. I'm going to hand you over to our host, Jonathan bowman Perks. Thank you very much indeed, Manly. And I've just finished uh, listening to your audiobook, which uh -huh. I absolutely love. Uh, we were talking about it earlier, you and I, but you've got a great voice for audiobooks, and it was it was compelling. Uh, Compassionate Leadership is the book. I commend it to everybody listening uh, around the world. It's a really great book with some, uh, you're a fantastic storyteller and you've done some amazing things which you have some great stories to tell. And, and it's this lovely mix of humanity, humility and a uh, lovely bit of humor and, and, and laughing both at yourself and the situation that you're in, which only, only a military officer would be able to do that when things are really bad. Uh, it's definitely rule number six. Don't take yourself too damn seriously. Absolutely. So, so Manny, thank you for coming on the series. Let's talk about um, some of the work you're doing right now. Uh, yep. the, uh, you don't need to obviously mention names of companies you're working with, but the kind of work that you're doing. Um, and then we're going to go back to uh, to childhood and come forward with a couple of the events that have gone on. So over to you. Yeah. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, <laughs> Over the years, and I've been in the space I'm in now for over 20 years since I skipped it in the race around the world and the global challenge, all the business leaders I speak to, that they come to me with essentially two issues, two concerns, two desires. It's either to transform, to shift direction, or it's to perform, to increase speed. So they either want to grow and get bigger or they want to change direction. And in reality, they are both the same thing. It's a vector, uh, speed or direction. We're trying to make a change. And so uh, over the years, we've been working with these business leaders and met some inspiring people. Think, well, we know so much about change. We hear so much about the failure of change and why it goes wrong. And there's so much evidence and research to say that generally corporate change programs don't work. And why is it? So uh, I did a lot of research on the, the psychology of change, what was happening there. I realized actually transformation performance comes down to commitment. If you can get people's commitment to the new journey, well, if you've got commitment, you've got engagement, you've got collaboration, you've got communication, you've got uh, innovation and ownership without doubt, you've got resilience, you've got happiness, you've got well being, and you get performance. So then my work in the last 15 years now has been how do we get commitment? Where does commitment come from? Forget about the perform or the transform, if you like, that's the outcome. Because if you've got commitment, you can do anything you want. And you think about it, the biggest leadership problem then isn't to try and get the energy, it's trying to channel the energy. Now, that to me sounds like a much more exciting problem. So then you start thinking about commitment and the psychology of commitment and realize that it comes from self-worth. That if I can see my personal journey, my emotional journey within or through the direction that you want to take me, well, then you've got me. There's no argument because it's there deep within me. And so I thought, great, so that's what we've got to do it. So that's where the premise of compassionate leadership came in right at the very, very beginning. Uh, and, and that was around gaining commitment because what we're trying to do with compassion is understanding with positive action is to tap into people's self-worth. And then I look at the neural physiology behind it and think, what is driving the psychology? And then that has impacted massively in the style that I work. So what I find I do now is that I work with business leaders and business communities quite literally all over the world, though I haven't flown out to see them in the last 15 months or so, uh, though that is beginning to change, which is lovely. And I'll, I'll help them with the cultural aspect of transformation or performance. That we tend to find in the business world that we'll pull four intellectual levers, which are strategy, process, organization, and finance. And it's right that those levers are aligned and they're to do with our new strategy, but nothing changes until you change the culture, until you get that belief and that commitment. So that's in essence, the work that I do. I am a storyteller, Jonathan, as you suggested, and I'm still a keynote speaker. And I use story as a hugely powerful tool to affect that emotional sort of uh, awareness, uh, reflection, awareness, sharing, and bring people's emotions to the surface, their real person. Uh, and that's what we then use to align and gain the commitment. So 
a storyteller, cultural change, but, but the emotional side of cultural yeah. change. Yeah, I, and it came across beautifully in your book when you, you talk about those occasions when you're trying to get a message across to someone and you weave it into a story. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's almost like uh, you know a story with a uh, almost like a, a message behind it that, that people, used, people get it. Yeah, I mean, we used to share wisdom that way. You think about it; all the religious teachings of the world use parables. Yeah, and and then there are fables, Aesop's, many others, and there are all the various stories that your grandmother used to tell you, and this sort mm. of stuff. And even in Aboriginal culture, they share wisdom through song, mm. uh, and and you can actually navigate through Australia by song. So by by having a story, by having it, I can tell you something what you should or shouldn't do, but yeah, that doesn't attach in your brain. And this is about understanding how our brain works. Yeah. And our brain works because if I'm telling you a story, then whatever emotions happening within my brain, what activities have my brain will mirror in yours. Yeah. If it's an emotional story, those emotions will kick off in you. If it's a story which may involve movement and other senses, like all stories do, well, those parts of your brain will kick off too. And it's like, you walk down the street and, and you smell baking bread. And so an image of your grandmother comes up in your mind. Well, that's the power of the brain. That's the power of the story. That's the power of this relating these different concepts together. Now, and I love it as well, because stories are exciting. Yeah, um, yeah. They're fun. I, and I'm just like you. I absolutely love stories. And there's uh, an audio book I listened to recently called um, Life is in the Transitions. It, it's not necessarily you need to read it, but, but the gist of it was this chat went around collecting stories. Uh, people and it often found that actually the bits that they tended to think they need to leave out was when things were going well and then suddenly big transition change happened even uh, people had a drama and then life carried on differently but they sort of try to miss that bit no 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 that bit is the most interesting it bit. is the, the bit the, you know the, 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 in, in the case with you the hurricane michael uh, let's talk about that bit because that was the most dramatic so um let's talk about your story so take take us back to Manly as the young man. Sort of what? How did you grow up? Who influenced you? What well, two or three events happened yeah. that make you the leader you are today? Gosh, well, I I, I think I was very fortunate actually. I, I come from a very loving family. I, I've got uh, two brothers and a sister. I'm the third of four. My father was Navy, so I don't come from anywhere because every two and a half years we moved. So, yes, I, I'm, I'm British, I'm English, I'm from the South Coast, but I, there isn't a village um, where, where Manly came from. There isn't a town, even a county. Um, so I, that has impacted me enormously in the, in the sense that I, I find it hard to settle, but I don't find that in a negative concept because I, I look at it in an exciting way that I'm always looking for the next element, the next part. What it also taught me was as soon as you arrive in a place, relax and be in it and actually meet people and, 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 and treat everyone in that same beautiful way. So I, I, I can go into a, a, a place and I can get to know people and meet people pretty quickly because that's what I did all my life and, and I, I had to. Uh, and, and again, I, I look on that as a, as a big bonus without doubt. So that was very much part, so always connected with the water. Um, had enormous respect for my father actually, who was an extraordinary man uh, and he joined the navy at 14 he, he ran away from home um well, my grandmother was lovely in my eyes but slightly overbearing in his i wouldn't quite let him fly the nest so he thought well i'm going uh and he, then he worked his way up through the ranks and by the age of 34 bear in mind he joined as an artistic apprentice the lowest of the low he was a commander so he wow. became an officer and then a commander at 34, an extraordinary man uh, who did so well. Very lucid, a great orator. And I always remember spending Christmas Day once on HMS Antrim when he was on duty. And it was just, as soon as you get up the gangplank and you say who you are, it's, oh, oh, you're, you're Lieutenant Commander Hopkinson's son. Oh, oh, let me show you around. And everybody on the ship knew my father, but knew him well and with respect and, and would just naturally go out their way to try and help because... He, he, he was that kind of person. So I was always brought up with the whole premise of leadership is actually inspiring the people that you work for in reality yeah. and, and looking after them and getting the best for them. He was a good sportsman as well. He used to play cricket and, and rugby for, for the Navy, United Service. I remember going to pictures, matches and watching him there too as well. You had a comment you wanted to make there, Jonathan. Yeah, I was just asking, I, from what you say, it sounds as if your father is no longer alive. Is that the case? He died last year, as it happens. I'm um, really sorry. That must well, have no, been profound. 
Well, yes, it was. But you know what? It's a funny old thing. I, and I don't want to sound, people may think, oh, man, he's a bit harsh. But he died at 86, having had a really full life and being fit and healthy all his life, a short illness, and then died in his sleep. Now, I, I'll take that. <laughs> yeah. yeah I'm, I'm about, I'll be, I'll be 60 next year. And if someone said, man, you've got another 26 years to go, shipmate. And then off you go. So actually, there is no sorrow because it was a, well, it was a life well lived, wasn't it? And he had the courage to live his own life. And these things are beautiful things. But thank you very much for that, Jonathan. I, I appreciate the sentiment. And then I remember there's one lovely story my mother tells when my dad was playing cricket and he was out there at the front just teeing up. And I was a five year old lad walking around the perimeter and I just bellowed out, Dad, I love you. <laughs> <laughs> so he raised his back. Thank you, son. All the fielders, the bowler, they're all in stitches of laughter and this sort of stuff. That's great. Yeah. So he, without doubt, had a big impact on me. And I am him. It's quite funny. My mannerisms, my voice. Um, you know, if, if you haven't met my father, it doesn't matter because you, you, you've now seen him, if you like, in a, in, a, a, in a slightly taller version, but that's fine. My mother also had a lovely impact on me in so many ways. And there's a story which she loves to tell. And I remember it. I, I'm pretty sure I remember it, actually. Or maybe I just remember the story now. I don't know. I would have been quite young, around sort of seven or, or eight, maybe. And my mother called me that I was a lively child, which I'm sure is a euphemism for being a pain in the backside. And, uh, and she was baking a cake and, uh, and I was annoying her, no doubt slamming a door or doing something just annoying. And I wouldn't stop. And she didn't want to bash me around the head with the cake spoon because that would destroy the mix. So she just said, Manly, if you carry on doing what you're doing, you've got to accept the consequences of your actions and redeem the situation. And it sounded serious, so I stopped. And later she sat down and said, Manny, do you understand what I said? I said, no, not really. She said, well, look, you chose to act in a particular way. You chose to do something. So whatever happens, you have to accept the fact that you chose to do it. So those are the consequences of, of your choice. And if some of those things happened which are bad, well, then you can't blame anybody else. You could accept it. And you're the person. You have to get yourself out of trouble to redeem the situation. What I understood from that was that you can do absolutely anything you like in the world if you accept the consequences of your actions and redeem the situation. And I'm pretty sure that that has an impact on my, my adventuring, if you know what I mean. I, I mean, mm. the, the first time I sailed across the English Channel at 16, I, I was a skipper on, on the boat. And even that was a funny story because it was a friend's parents' boat. The parents had never met each other. Uh, and uh, and I just said to my mum and dad, you know, I'm going to go selling my friend's parents. Is that OK? Said, yeah, fine. No problems. A few weeks later, they met for the first time. And my friend's parents came up to my mum and dad, shook their hands and said, gosh, we're so happy Manly was aboard because we'd never sailed before. <laughs> <laughs> and you weren't a qualified skipper. You just oh, no. <laughs> hell, hell no. Exactly. But the point was that you, you uh, I've always... I tell the story that before I did my adventure at the North Pole, that how did I know I could do it? Because I'd never done cross-country skiing before, taking on the magnetic North Pole, 365 miles. I was with two incredible Royal Marines who were eight years younger and very fit. So what made me think I could do it? And I think there's a good learning there. And I think I learned that early on. It says, well, you don't know, really, but you don't know until you try. And it's OK as long as you try and give it your best shot if you do or you don't. So... I think that there's a this sort of fear of failure that we, we hear more often in the business world and more adult world than we do in the junior world and the, as children growing up. It isn't a fear of failure. It's a fear of judgment of mm, failure. Because mm, mm. we fail all the time. We, 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 you know, who's ever walked for the very first time and did it in one shot? You didn't. You spent months trying to get it right. Language, everything we learn through trying and getting it wrong and then trying again and getting it right. And then... We seem to get that beaten out of us. But anyway, back to the sort of young man. Yeah, mum and dad, very influential. Um, and I think they gave me the freedom to be me uh, and encouraged us all four children to get out in the world and do our own thing. Um, it, it was a loving family and I, I'm always grateful for that, uh, um, which, which is great. I, and yeah, it, it, it was active, it was fit, we moved. Yeah, really interesting. Yeah. Well, uh, fun it, memories. It, 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 it's it's such a fascinating book, your your compassionate leadership, and people must read it because, um, as you say, the experience of sailing as the skipper round the world in the BT Global Challenge the the opposite way, 
uh, and and flying out of uh, uh, Hurricane Michael, uh, using it as a as a, a way to accelerate you through. It, it's a whole story in itself. We tragically haven't got time to talk about it, but and he, indeed the race to the magnetic uh, North Pole. But you could perhaps touch on that as we go through. But but. Um, Proudest moments and darkest moments in your work and your life and what you learned from them. What would you say those would be, Manny? Gosh, and, and there are many because in my current work, I, I'm, I'm very fortunate, um, I, I think, because I, I do passionately love what I do. I think I've got to the stage where I'm actually quite good at it now, um, which is quite nice. Um, and hopefully I'll get better. And the pride I get is, is the feedback I get from people um in that the impact my work has with them it, even you just talking lovely things about my book and the audio book you know I, I have a great sense of pride in that and but I'm very humble about it as well because it, it's very much me um it's sort of my learning and, and my understanding and my philosophies and they're not necessarily for everybody um you know I, I and so to hear people say Manny I really appreciate it. I like that w w was great so th I've got lots of proud moments, without doubt the BT Global Challenge was a life changer and mm. massively proud moment in so many ways. Um, and, and, and I know my, my father has a, a picture he, he always used to talk about, which is just the beginning of the start of the race as we're leaving Southampton Dock. And I'm just, my crew are busy doing stuff and I'm just leaning on the wheel, gazing out into the distance. And he, he looked at it and thought, and I know exactly what he's thinking. He's just thinking, right, here we go. <laughs> I wonder what will happen, which was entirely what was going through my mind. Yeah. So all those moments I, I, I'm hugely proud of. I'm, gosh, I'm proud of my children too. I've got a son and a daughter, Frey and Arabella, who will be 19 and 17 in a week and two weeks' time, getting out into the world. I think they're lovely people. They're still normal humans and kids and obviously get stuff wrong. No one's perfect. But yeah, I, I'm I'm proud of them in, in such a way, and I I believe my role as a as a as a father is to uh, um, help them have the courage to lead their own life and be themselves. My daughter is hugely independent and strong as a character, which I think is so important. And my son has his way in the world too. So those things that I'm hugely proud of. The North Pole was a big thing too because you know, I hadn't done anything like that before. Mm. Two people who. Um, Two ex Royal Marines, both chest covered in medals, eight years younger, both fitter, both stronger. And I think one of the best compliments I ever got, bearing in mind, I got quite close to joining the Marines myself. Um, I was going to transfer from the Navy uh, and I did the potential officers course at Limston and passed that. Oh, at the yeah. same time, I got a letter from Limston saying, come and join us in South Devon. I got a letter from Hong Kong saying, come to Hong Kong police in South China. So South China, South Devon, I did the China route. But after the uh, race to the North Pole, one of the best compliments I ever got, and I remember this deeply, was one of the chaps saying, Manly, you would have made a good Marine. Oh, lovely. What a and compliment. They, yeah, they, they, they well, don't give that lightly. They do not they, give that lightly. They, they, no, they don't. No, no, they don't. It's my, yeah, exactly. So those are really proud moments. Um, and it's a funny thing with pride, isn't it? Because pride's a good thing, but you've got to be careful with it too. Um, because you need humility with it. So, you know, when people say, Manly, yeah, well done I enjoyed that or you know the Hurricane Michael you kept me alive we did great stuff you enjoyed that you have to say yeah thank you I, I appreciate that and and I appreciate where it comes from but you've got to keep your feet on the ground too um, and recognize that life's a journey it's always learning um, darkest moments I, I have quite a sort of funny old filter in my head really that <laughs> everything's great uh, <laughs> and that um, I, I, I potentially but then you know, the back end of Hong Kong was tough for me. Um, I, I left the Hong Kong police, but then stayed in Hong Kong and set up a boat building marine servicing company, Manly Marine, which transliterated as Manley, which means 10,000 miles. So it's quite a good name. But unfortunately, I, I had a slight issue with a, um, a couple of triads um, I, I, and it all got a bit pressured and stuff. And a, a big boat owner came in and stopped paying me. So there's a bit of pressure there. Like my first wife at the time was really struggling with the whole situation and, and uh, we had to do a bit of a runner and ended up in divorce and all sorts of stuff. And you could argue that those are sort of dark moments, but even now I don't remember them as such. I remember them as being tricky and tough, but great learning. Um, but it was tricky. And it's nice that yeah, I'm still in contact with my ex-wife. We're still friends, which is lovely. 
we realized that we just had to go our own way and that's a good thing but that was tough at that particular time um i could have argued from a business perspective it was well because my business is doing very well and unfortunately you know i lost everything mm. but then you start again so i ended up in papua new guinea and and uh and then ended up rejoining the navy for the first gulf war so these things happen and all for a reason wow. and i wouldn't have been here now um, had I not done that, I wouldn't have had the opportunity to sail around the world had I not done that rejoin. There's so many, I, I love this sort of principle, whether it's the sliding doors, but each, each decision you make or don't make shuts down a complete universe and opens up another one. And so rather than dwelling on a universe that didn't happen, just get on with the one that is happening. Yeah. It, it to me, seems to make much more sense. Very, very, very wise, very wise. Yeah. I, I love that as a bit. Sorry, I interrupted you. you no, that's all right. I'm just saying, even the tough moments, by definition, are opportunities, aren't they? They're opportunities to learn. It may not have been a choice. I would have chosen that route. But you know what? I, who says you always make the right choices anyway? Yeah, but you've learned a lot so that when the people you're coaching and the teams you're developing, when they hit, uh, the shit hits the fan, I imagine you stay calm in the storm because you go, look, no one's died here. Let's just, let's just get on with it. Um, <laughs> Because that was the expression my father used to use. No one's yeah. shooting at me. It's all right. It's yeah, exactly. Right. And 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 you also <laughs> you also uh, unlike the poor skipper that I talked to before in the um, uh, the other clipper race, he, he lost one of his crew, got killed, mm. and, and that, that's just you know horrible. You, horrible. And you you took them all there and you brought them all back, and not only did they come back, they came back changed people with they, they with, do. With, with with very different people who are still in touch with you. Let's uh, think about advice. Now you've learned, uh, and, and you and I are the same age. Now we've learned all these things. If you went back and met the 16 year old Manly who was, there he was already full of uh, daring do and glory sailing across the channel. But, but what bit of advice would you say to him? Hey, this really matters, but don't worry about that. What would, if you could revisit yourself and give a bit of wisdom, what would you say? Without doubt, I missed out on some opportunities. <clears throat> and, and I think I, I was, I matured quite late, uh, even if I have now, I don't know. Um, and I matured, I don't mean necessarily physically, I mean mentally and taking responsibility and this sort of stuff. I think I was very immature. I didn't really um, <clears throat> make the most of my first time in the Navy. Um, I, I think I was a bit of a, um, when I look at my uh, um, reports, um, and they always said Hopkinson could do better, but also said that he wasn't taking it seriously enough, you know, and, and funny, jocular, humorous, fair enough, but it's all right. But I, I, I think there are opportunities without doubt that I missed. I think I got distracted by the more immediate and the more sort of hedonistic um, demands. Um, <clears throat> I'm just thinking one small one that a ship popped into New York on the way back from some event. And whereas a good friend of mine on the ship, that went off on some beautiful sailing on a beautiful yacht. I just went down Magaluf and, and got drunk in the nightclubs. And I thought, actually, that was a missed opportunity because later on, yeah, I was a professional sailor. I got there, but you don't know. So I think, I, I think what would I say to young Manly? I'd say, enjoy yourself, shipmate, but, but don't miss opportunities. And maybe be, don't grow up and grow old. I, I like the expression that maturity is knowing when to be responsible. I, and I think... I wish I knew that earlier. Yeah. Because yeah. I think there are times I should have been when I wasn't. Yeah. And I think quite now, I think I'm quite good at that because if I don't have to be, I don't pretend. And I see a lot of people who tend to grow old and grow serious far too soon. Um, but knowing when to be responsible, I think is a good thing. And I think I missed out a few things. I think, yeah, I think I was a bit immature. And Hong Kong police, I was definitely, um, <laughs> I, I didn't take it very seriously, I'm afraid. Yeah. Um, well, I, I think you're a big rugby man, aren't you? I do like my rugby, and I, I made a pact in 1991 with my best chum to go to every single Rugby World Cup until we die, which is quite a nice one, too. So I yeah. do like my rugby very much. And that will get you around the world. Uh, no, great, great advice. And now I just want to take you around my own sort of framework, but it's not, uh, as you know, there is no silver bullet on leadership. You have compassionate leadership, and I have inspired leadership, but I, I, I see so many parallels and so many uh, resonant themes but if we just use that as a framework for a conversation yep. for you to share one or two tips with the audience that are listening um the fundamental values your big five uh, yeah. I, I talk about moral care do we just share what those are perhaps you don't have we don't have time to go into too much detail but what what are your big five 
Okay, fantastic. Thank the big five, and there's at the front of my book as well, are awareness, courage, confidence, joy, and compassion. And, and very briefly, it's got to all start with awareness. We have to be hugely aware of who we are. To live a life of meaning and purpose, it has to come down from who we really are. There are so many external distractions on motivation. There are lots of people who say, hey, put a picture of the big yacht on the wall and the big house and the big car, that'll inspire you. No, it doesn't, it distracts you. It distracts you from being the real you. So awareness of self is key and awareness of others is absolutely key. Otherwise, how can we relate? How can we influence? How can we lead? How can we collaborate? How can we become friends without that? So I think the awareness is without doubt the number one. I think we could do anything. If we could raise the emotional awareness, the emotional intelligence of humanity, life would change in such a dramatic way. The second one is courage. And by this, I mean a couple of things. Courage to live your own life and also courage to take the steps and make the big decisions. And possibly early on in my life, I wasn't quite courageous enough to do some of the things that we spoke about. Mm. And by definition, to live your own life will take courage because there are so many pressures for us to conform to social norms uh, and whatever it may be, and also to conform to society's expectation what success means. You know, how can we be successful if you don't have a big car? Well, I, I don't want one, thank you. Um, so awareness and courage, confidence, Confidence is to believe in yourself. Wow. To believe in yourself, you can make it work. Um, and to believe in others too, to believe in your colleagues and this sort of stuff. Now, sometimes you might argue that my confidence was misplaced, but you know what? It doesn't matter. I'm always going to start with confidence and give it a best shot and make sure it never becomes arrogance too. The joy, you've got to enjoy the journey. I talk about this with life as well, because if you think about it, the destination for life is death. That doesn't sound like fun to me. And I think we get distracted by the destination. We get distracted by later on in our life, by pensions, by objects, by materialism. We're not enjoying the journey, enjoying the moment. In reality, this moment now, Jonathan, is our only real moment in our life. Mm. What's gone has gone, what hasn't happened yet, isn't real. This is it, sorry, mate, but this is it. So we might as well enjoy it. And I think if I could help anybody, just enjoy the journey. When mm. I sign my book, I always sign it, enjoy the journey. And I mean it profoundly, I really do. And then the compassion is the understanding and positive action to help other people on their life too, their life of awareness, courage, confidence, and joy, and compassion. And, yeah. and I, they, they came to me over many years. It, it wasn't a, a light bulb moment per se, but it was a realization of, of people asking me, Melly, what's important to you and how do you work and where does your work take you? And the two are the same. That is yeah. my work and it's me. Uh, and, and I think it's lovely the way you you put meaning around them uh, in again in your book compassionate leadership you talked so well about so many firms have sort of names uh, <laughs> values up on some screen but but you particularly with your crew uh, as the skipper wanted to make it meaningful in little sayings and words yeah uh, and and um <laughs> And, and I found that very, very powerful. And, and that will, you will be really great for so many teams who need that. They're just wandering around aimlessly. Uh, yeah, and very, very briefly on that, even, even with the concepts of, of that with, with the crew, you know, I, I didn't make the rules. No. Because if I made that's... the rules and I've got to police the rules. So I, we work together to create how we're going to work together. And that would be my encouragement to business leaders is don't lock yourself in a small room with an elite and say how it's going to be, engage everybody. Yeah. And how are you? Because remember what we said earlier, that if, if I know who I am and I can align who I am with where I am, what I'm doing, that's my commitment. Yeah. You know, yeah. And, and if they own it, if the people own it, I mean, on time all the time is one of our expressions, which we actually translated to being um, 10 minutes uh, early is late. Yeah, I, 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 love, I, I, just <laughs> love, I just love it. But that links so nicely, all of the things you say, to almost the, se the second of our eight um, uh, sort of principles of, of, of a way of leading, which yeah. is around PQ, meaning and purpose. What purpose question, you know, what gives your life meaning and purpose? And you really are living your life on purpose. You feel it very purposeful, but you help people find that sense of purpose. What would be your, your top tip on really getting your, your sense of a life purpose? There was a lovely model, which I stumbled across and I, I can't remember whose it was i think it was just an open there and it says purpose is the place where four circles intersect if you know what i mean one is you enjoy it you're quite good at it 
the world needs it, and you earn a living. And we think about all those four coming together, then actually it's not bad, is it? Now, if something you enjoy and you're good at that people want, and somehow you can t- contrive to exist with it as well and make it the center of your, your earning, then that's that's quite a nice sort of context on, on, on purpose. Um, and, and this is where I think, again, I'm, I'm very fortunate in, 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 in my work that I'm deeply motivated by um, teams. I love works, working with people. I, I, I do love my own space, my own energy. And I you know, sometimes going for a, a long run or a walk by the sea on my own is beautiful and helps me just settle. But you know, I wouldn't want to sail around the world on my own necessarily. I'd rather do it with a group of people. Yeah, I, yeah. And, and I also get great satisfaction. I, it is a selfish thing from helping other people grow. Mm. And when I'm helping other people grow, I feel good. And so my sense of purpose is, is within that. And, and maybe in the early years, as I was flapping around doing different things, it only came together. I, I must thank Sir Che Blythe for the opportunity to sail around the world. I think that was the moment when I realized my purpose, when, when I realized it wasn't even about the sailing per se, it was about the people yeah, um, yeah. And, and helping them grow. And, and my crew were extraordinary people. Um, they really were. And I, it was such an honor and a pleasure. And, and just one of them I met later on in life, his nickname was The Professor, the older yeah, chap yeah. on the boat. And um, we caught up and he said, Manny, I'm still the same person. I, I still live in Oxfordshire. I, I still go to the same cafe, but I walk taller. And I thought, what a beautiful expression. If nothing else, those few moments, those few months together, and the professor is an amazing fellow, Roger, um, who was invaluable to me and helping me in my journey as well, walks taller. That's got to yeah, be a good yeah. thing, isn't it? It's got to be great. Well, well, again, your stories, when you talk about the professor and a, another one by the name of a fish like trout, was it or something? <laughs> uh, <laughs> yes. And the two of them are having this conversation, yelling in the storm about about he was down in the snake pit and he was back there sailing it. And, and they were trying to have this conversation and getting stroppy. And you used it as an opportunity to coach them, which was yeah. just live in the moment. It was a miscommunication. Someone mm. had asked for something they hadn't responded and acknowledged. And so an assumption was made it hadn't been heard. And because this had been heard, the assumption was made, they'll be patient, I'll get on with it. So assumptions were made, poor communication. And rather than scream and shout, I thought, can't team, what happened there? Uh, yeah. And, and yeah we did use an opportunity no um, great just just just, just lovely it's, it's what some call about you know teachable moments or whatever yeah. it is you know it, it's a lovely opportunity always learning um now going to the um the magnetic north pole in a, in a race uh, and the way you had to i think you were skiing for 14 hours a day or something phenomenal for 10 days and then you had to have this this rigorous routine to keep yourself in good health and also when you're sitting around the world with such a big crew, keeping yourself good health and well-being, the HQ, the third, yeah. it's got to be really big for you. So what would be your top tip to people listening? Uh, here you are almost 60 in great health. I trust, I hope, and long may it be. <laughs> what would be your top tip on mental health and your top tip on physical health that, that now right. we, you and I are older? What, what would you say at our age? <laughs> OK, so the easier one to deal with is the physical. Um, and what's extraordinary, it's only when you lose ability, you realize how precious it is or was, where you, you, know, you may even stub your toe and then it's a struggle to put your boot on uh, and walk, or you've hurt your thumb and then you realize you can't tie up your shoelaces. The danger of the health bit is that we totally take our health for granted. Uh, and, I, and I look at society and, and the health issues we have, Convenience is an absolute killer. Convenience in the food, which means we don't now eat normal food, we eat processed food, which is so unhealthy for us. Convenience in thinking, well, I I won't just walk down to the little shop, I'll jump in the car and zoom down. So all these opportunities to be eat well, be well, be active, we take away in this false premise of convenience. So any opportunity, um, even if I go cycling with some chums, a lot of them have got some very fancy bikes and even just a wheel, one of their bikes is worth 10 times more than my whole bike, which actually is made from bamboo and I got when I lived out in Bali. But I'm doing more exercise than they are. They're whistling along with no exercise at all. So what's the benefit? But I've got this old, old pub bike and I'm having to really pull out my effort. So it's, it's better fizz is what I say. It's more physical activity. Yeah. 
Um, I, I like to have a challenge. I'm, I'm, I'm doing the London Marathon this October, uh, raising money for the Halo Trust. Well done. Um, and, you know, that's just coming back from a year of not running because I damaged my heel. I thought, yeah, I've got to get on with it um, I, I, and, and do it and stop whinging. And, and it's given me a purpose, a sense of meaning and purpose around it. So the health is so important. So I urge people to eat well and eat ethically, too. So I'm not a vegetarian, but I don't eat much meat. Yeah. Um, I try and eat food, which is good, wholesome, ethical, sustainable, organic, all that stuff, as much as you can. Um, uh, and eat less, but eat well. Yeah. Um, I do like a beer. I'll be quite honest with you, Jonathan. I, I do like a beer, but you know, I, I, I don't binge quite like I used to. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, and I I rarely hit the hard stuff, to be honest. So I do like to enjoy myself, and I do like to get out there and do stuff. But that's a compromise. So I'll go for a run. I'll cycle. I'll be active. I sail. I ski, and that's our choice to be active. And I think for health. We must never, ever take it for granted because if it goes badly, it's gone. And the quality of life changes dramatically. Um, but then, well, you know, because I, I listened to one of your pods recently from amazing guy, Chris Moon, who mm. you can argue lost a, an arm and a leg and that could have impacted. But no, he's one of the fittest, healthiest people I know. Extraordinary fellow. Well, it's it's so lovely, the connection with Hugh, who's been on one of the podcasts, and and you work with Hugh and your old friends from the Royal Hong Kong Police. Or yeah. you, were, uh, you got to know each other when he, he said he heard you speaking. Uh, or, or he didn't tell you who was going to come, and he sat in the front row. That's right, and he, he did. Sat there, and he went, you bastard. You know? And um, that was nice. And Chris and you uh, are great friends, and both very complimentary. And, of course, we also had the CEO of the Halo Trust, uh, yeah. one of the generals, uh, whose name's gone out of my uh, head at the moment. He also spoke and was very interesting. Um, and what about what about mental health? Yeah, and, and this to me is about that life of purpose that I talk about. I think that is mental health. I, 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 I try and talk about it, saying that who we are, the the real core character, that Manly's ego, my sense of how I relate to the world, my values are pretty much fixed around eight years old. And there's a lot of the psychology around that as well as well as the neurophysiology. There used to be an old Jesuit saying, saying, you know, give me a child to the eight and I'll give you the adult. And, and that's a reality. But then what also happens around eight years old, there's a little bit of malleability around teenagers where a brain does a reset, but nothing changes. We are fundamentally the same person. But around eight years old, we also suddenly realize we're being judged. And if you've got children or you had children around that age between sort of eight and 10, you realize they move from that beautiful innocence of just getting on with the world in their own way to a sense of, oh, hang on a second, what should I say? There's a hesitancy to be themselves mm. because we also have a natural instinct to fit in and conform. We're, we're a tribal species, always have been. It's been our survival mechanism for millions of years or hundreds of thousands of years. And, 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 and what happens is we then end up being dragged further away from who we really are by the dominant cultures we're within. And that's fine to a degree. Um, and we want to be part of society, we want to be part of a group. But what happens is if that gap gets too much is that we now find ourselves in a psychological conflict because we cannot fulfill our own self. And this is self-worth, mm. it's our baseline is self-worth. So if you're not fulfilling self-worth, you're in psychological conflict. And I, I would argue that the society we've created now and ever since moving on from industrial revolution times and beyond, it's building us up so we're so detached from who we really want to be. And that explains all the road rage and anger we see, the social media trolling, which is grotesque, what happens in the language there. Well, there's a general unhappiness and, and dissatisfaction. Even you know, when you beep and swear in your car and things like this. And mental health comes from a place of self-worth. So understanding yourself first is absolutely key, what's important to you. And then having the courage to live that. Mm. There's an amazing Australian uh, uh, lady called Bronnie Ware, who was a palliative care nurse. And she wrote a blog, which then a brilliant book called The Five Regrets of the Dying. Mm. And as she was holding, it impacts my work and has impacted my work a great deal. And as she held the hands of people in the last few months of life, no matter their social structure or where they came from, or even their age, old ones and young ones alike, there was the same conversation, which turned around to regrets. And the biggest regret was, I wish I'd had the courage to live my own life. Second biggest regret, I wish I'd spent more time with my friends and family. And the third, I wish I hadn't worked so hard. 
there are others too. And I think mental health is one of self-worth. I think it's, it's, it's being you. And I think the society we created is so broken in so many ways with such inequity and such anger and lack of compassion. And compassion is understanding with positive action. Um, that's the, I use the Dalai Lama's description of it, obviously I paraphrase. And I think that's it. I think mental health then comes from understanding self and trying to live as close as you can to who you are, recognizing there's a compromise. You know, I can't be there, you're old manly. I, I've got responsibilities I need to do, you know. Um, I, 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 but I can be close enough that, and psychologists reckon that if there's a two thirds overlap between who you are and how you're acting and what you're doing, then that psychology is a nice place to be. Yeah. And that, that to me is it, Jonathan, it's so important. Uh, so agree everything you say resonates very strongly from my and, experience and, and what i've learned and in all my work what i actually do is help people tap into that so i help people recognize and rediscover their eight-year-old self and that's why i use the power of metaphor and story to do it it's beautiful and then bring it to the surface and share it with their colleagues and what you find is that the synergies are, are, are deep and exquisite and the differences are inspiring i I was recently asked to write an article about how do you bring diverse teams together? And my premise was there was no such thing as a non-diverse team. So rather than focus on the color and creed and the external social layers, let's get down to the humanity. Because when you get down to the humanity, you strip away the layers of the onion to get down to the core. We're all here to connect and create and grow. And we all, our synergies are beautiful. And I've run this particular exercise using the story all over the world from Japanese industrialists, the Saudi royal families, the Mexican oil workers, and American corporate leaders, and the Italian farmers. And the same words come out every single time. And so if we can tap into our humanity, we're in a different place. It, it, it links and it works. Yeah, which, which is really, in, in some ways, I was going to talk about the next thing, which is EQ, emotional and yes. social intelligence, which you've talked about, about the importance of self-awareness and, and awareness of other, you talk about you, me, um, you, me, and, and us. And, and I, I do find this, this ability to understand and be self-aware, but then manage your emotions and understand others and manage the situation and understand the, the wider environment. And you talk about you know, people, profit, and, and planet. I mean, it, it's lovely seeing a leader who really gets planet. You know, you've been ahead of the power curve for a long time by saying, we mustn't forget the planet. Now they're going, oh my God, there's a problem with the planet. I go, oh, really surprised, you know, wow. <laughs> I've been sailing around it and noticing it. I've been through yeah. you know, gallons of plastic floating on the oceans. Um, what would be your top tip when you've got um, a leadership team or individuals you're coaching uh, either the teams or, or, or the individuals or probably both, where there's a there's a high level of EQ, uh, sorry IQ. They're clever people, but they really have not got much emotional and social. If there's one thing that you find makes them develop that better, what what have you used? Um, and, and you're quite right. The danger is that the EQ sort of gets beaten out of us. You know, big boys don't cry and all that sort of malarkey. Um, I, I, and and we're not meant to express it. It's also um, personal. So as we go through the, the corporate world, and, and I would argue the last 15, 20 odd years plus has been hugely aggressive developments within it. Um, we only focus on the I side of life, the IQ side. We don't focus on the EQ. I, I do see a shift without doubt, Jonathan, happening as we move into greater sense of awareness of self and relationship and this sort of side. And, and it comes down to that awareness again. I mean, I, I work with business leaders. We use this metaphor and the story to accelerate the reflection and sharing in a safe space. And once you've done that, you see the light bulbs go on. If you go, because very briefly, and I recognize with time that if I'm telling you a deep story and I've got images and videos behind me and we're off to say around the world and there's a video of it, your brain is connected at a conscious level and at a subconscious level. At a subconscious level, everything is involved. Your amygdala deep in your brain is filtering it all, putting it all around the brain, sharing it in. And then I stop and ask you three questions. So you're, I'm going to say, you're no longer the leaders. You're with me on this journey. I, I, and then people respond in the journey. So they respond in the story, which is an incredible metaphor. And then we share in the story because it's safe. And it's, hey, it's just so in the world. I can share. But then when I do that, and then I say, okay, well, 
let's pretend it's real life. You're not in the story anymore. You are the business leaders. I want you to look down what you've just written and tell me what you want to change. And invariably they say, well, well nothing. And actually, this is me. This is what I want. Mm. And that's all they've got to do is to bring that real self to work. So from an EQ side, it comes down to awareness again and, and, and recognizing that knowing yourself is the most important thing, not just to fulfill yourself, but also to stop yourself getting in the way because it's my prejudices and preferences and stuff that gets in the way of me connecting with other people. Um, and, and how can you, you know, I like being rugby, being rugby. So brilliant. You see, so I might motivate my team. So right team, let's go watch a rugby game and drink lots of beer, but they may like something completely different. And that's the danger, isn't it? But, but you've touched on something which is nicely a segue to the next thing, which is CQ, cultural intelligence yeah, yeah, question. Yeah. And, and you more than anybody with your world travel and all these different places, Japan and, you know, New York or wherever in my Africa, uh, more than ever, Hong Kong and, and all the, the learning about the Chinese and the triads and things like that. What would be your tip about people having greater diversity, equality and inclusion? Because it really is, it's something people can't avoid anymore. They, they, people have been able to get away with being racist. They, they can no longer do that. They've got to be more inclusive. What's your top tip? And and and, and rightly we should for so many reasons, a hundred percent. And I've always found that wherever I've travelled, I've never gone in with the attitude of I, I'm the big white man. So I've always gone in with humility and intent to understand and I think is the intent to understand is the critical part so whilst in Japan I may not get all their customs right but they know my intent has always been to get it right so it hasn't been an arrogant intent of hey this is me I come from the west this is the way I do things there's always been an intent to understand because I'll ask them I'll say look what's, what's what's the best way for me doing this now how should it work and what I find with that it's even a joke, you know, that that speaking France in French in Paris, for example, as an Englishman, I'm sure it must offend their ears with my horrible dialect and accent. But I've never met anything apart from friendship when I've tried. And, you know, to say hello in 40 languages, even if the next thing they say comes back, at you, you don't know. But the point is, what's your intent? Yeah, lovely. So I think the cultural quotient one is, is again, it's humility because no one is right, no one is wrong. We just brought up in different areas. It's recognizing the commonality of humanity, the core person inside, whether it's that Japanese industries or whether it's the, 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 the German industries that I've got a session next week with, or whether it's the healthcare person from India that I'm working with. We're, we're humans trying to get on and do our best. We can all learn from each other. So the cultural bit is definitely humility and then intent to understand. Um, and being a, I was made a chief in Nigeria, which was an extraordinary honor and, and, and culture. And even that was just an amazing moment because, it, you know, I, it was an honor in their culture, which is so profound for what we've done. And, and then these amazing chiefs, and this young king, and I learned incredible lessons on leadership from that I share all the time. First, I listen was a beautiful leadership lesson, which I've never, ever forgotten. So there you go. I think it's intent, humility. And just get enjoying, stuck in, and enjoy the richness of life. Gosh, I'd hate to just do it all the same way. Yeah, you you are like a human dynamo. There's just such a lovely energy about you. But <laughs> but in the middle of all that, there's these moments, like you say in your book, where that chief said to you, uh, first I listen," and and I it really stuck with me too. And everybody you meet has something to teach you. Only yeah, yeah, you listen 100%. to them. Um, Moving on nicely with your stories of, uh, of the, the crazy things you've pushed yourself to do, even when you go skiing with Hugh and stuff, you, you always go, uh, you know, uh, that, like the, the German general at Gallipoli who said, wonderful fellow, the British, they always go through the thickest part of the hedge. Uh, but you, yeah, <laughs> you, you, you go for it and, and you know, polar exploring and, and sailing and things like that. What's a one tip on RQ, resilience against adversity? What, what would be a one tip that you'd give a leadership tip from all that experience you've had? It's an interesting thing with resilience. I, 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 early on in lockdown, I, I was with all the Zoom things were kicking off. I, I, I heard a fascinating person talk about resilience. And their premise was, you can't be resilient unless you've gone through hardship. I, I fundamentally disagree. I must confess. I think hardship can help, um, but also it can knock you down. 
and I think resilience, again, I don't want to repeat it, but it sounds like I am, is awareness again, because um, resilience is commitment. So if I'm committed to something, then the chances are I'll pick myself up, dust myself off and carry on. If I'm not really interested in something, if, if I say, well, you know, I, I, I don't know, I want to go through that door there. Uh, and uh, and you say, yeah, Manly, no, don't do it. Oh, all right then. But if I'm really committed to get through that door, you won't stop me. And so I think resilience is such a beautiful concept. Obviously, physical resilience helps, but your mind is far more powerful than your body, far more than you believe. And you'll know that from your early army training, where they yeah. beast you and you think yeah. you're knackered. And they say, right, do it again. And yeah. Oh, P Company. P Company was a classic one of that. When they would take us around on the 10 mile bash with our 60 pounds of kit, we'll get to the gate ready, thinking of showers and relaxing. And they go, right, we'll go and do it again. Turn around, off you go. And, and you see, and half, you know, like half the guys give up because they're this mental image and it's all been broken. Yeah, and of yeah, course, yeah. just like you in a storm, you know, the weather's not nice to you. And, yeah. and, the, and the enemy don't stop at four o'clock for tea and biscuits. So really? it's gonna get, get over it. Well, I thought they did. No, but but you, 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 you reminded me of Rodney Flowers, Rodney C. Flowers, who's on an earlier podcast, uh, who was going to become an NFL player and grew up in uh, a really tough black township um, part of, of the state. And, and he was crushed when his uh, tackle in football led to him being paralyzed. But for 18 years, he struggled to walk again. His book, Get Up, which is uh, wow. worth reading. He Sounds is like I need to read it. every day he's, he, he fights to get up and he gets on his crutches and he goes half a mile up and down a really steep hill and, mm. and, and, and he falls over. But he gets up again because he's, as you say, he's got commitment. He's determined to, to be an example to others that he won't give up. And this is the thing. So that resilience comes from inside. Yes. It, it's not an external thing. It's a deep internal concept of resilience. And that's why recognizing yourself and your self-worth and, and like even the North Pole bit, you know, I'd made a commitment to the lads um, that I said to them, they'll never have to say, hurry up, manly. So that external commitment did two things. It a, gave them confidence that I, I wouldn't be a liability. But it gave me a, a nudge that I'd made that commitment. And so yeah. I mustn't break it now. And one stage, halfway through the race, I was feeling sorry for myself. And I think self-pity is the worst human emotion. And I just couldn't get warm. And my hips were hurting. And my fingers were cold. Oh, why am I here? And this sort of stuff. And I was moping along. And I looked up. And I saw the two Royal Marines 200 meters in front. And that was enough for me to think, come on, man, leap. snap out of it, sunshine. Catch him up and be positive. You know, and, and that's that inner worth again yeah if they turn around to say hurry up manly no you would have been eaten by a polar bear you told me that the third yeah, person yeah, exactly. back for the polar bear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> i love that story hey that's great and um last couple of them we'll just talk about uh, uh teams and then yeah. a book and then your top tip um a quick one on brand uh personal brand reputation image impact what people think about you how do you help people become really aware of others views and 360s what have you what do you find works well when you work with teams to get them to be more aware of what others think of them rather than deluding themselves with their own ego chamber yeah and i think i think the journey to that jonathan again is being conscious of self because when you're conscious of self how, how can you be aware of other people if you're not aware of yourself how can you be compassionate to others if you're not compassionate to yourself how can you relate to others if you can't relate to yourself first? How can you be kind to others if you can't be kind to yourself? And there's compassion starts at home. And, and what I see is that if we're in denial of who we are, then our ability to relate with other people is compromised. And if our ability to relate is compromised, so is our ability to collaborate, to lead, to motivate, to influence, to do all these incredible things that we know we need to do. So, so I think in that premise, it really is around um, working with yourself first and thinking, okay, well, who am I? We, society pumps us full of self-importance, which is a slight problem, I think, um, because we're all slightly ridiculous at the end of the day. Um, I, I, when you're mid-ocean or mid-Arctic or high up in a mountain, you understand your insignificance. And there's a lovely expression I use, which says the graveyard is full of indispensable people. And we kind of think we're indispensable, but actually we're not. Because even if I put my clogs now, right, there'll be a few unhappy people for a couple of weeks and then the world will carry on. <laughs> Nothing will change. 
and I wouldn't want them to be unhappy for much longer than that either necessarily. So I think I think the bit to relate to other people is is being truly humble yourself and, and not being carried away with your ego. Enjoy the skills you have, enjoy the influence you have, enjoy who you are, but be cognizant and kind with yourself because then that'll help you with others too. There's a lovely expression which is so true and I've lived it is that if, if you're in trouble, you're struggling, well, go and help somebody else because then you'll feel better. Yeah. And, and, I, and I think that's the premise. I think, I think it's that desire, that intent to help others and grow and not get caught up in yourself all the time. Brilliant. Not take yourself too seriously. Exactly. No, I love that one. Okay, thank you for that. And then brand, um, after brand, legacy. Uh, when you die, uh, and people aren't too sad for two weeks after that, I hope they move <laughs> on. Um, what would you like your legacy to be? What would you like them to say in a sentence about Manly? Well, I think they'll say he definitely, definitely lived life to the full. <clears throat> and they'll say he, he lived a life for, of purpose. I, I hope they say that too. And I, I'm, the, when I discovered through all the work and the people I met, <clears throat> and when I say I met incredible people, Jonathan, I don't just mean the thought leaders, I just mean people. Mm. And I've learned from Gosh, every single person I meet, my, my kids have been the best teachers I've ever had. I've learned so much. Um, I, I think my, my, if my legacy is tied up with compassion, I, I'll be happy. I was very, very, very honored and privileged that even the Dalai Lama commended me my work on compassion. And I think that's it. We've got to be compassionate to ourselves, to each other, to the planet, understanding with positive action. I, I challenge business leaders. Understanding positive action, and someone sits in the audience with these non disposable coffee cups. I say, We understand that that's not good, but we still choose to do it through convenience. So now we know that's not just not compassionate, that is actively being discompassionate. We're ignoring a knowledge just for our own benefit short term. If you can't sit down for that coffee or don't bring your reusable cup, don't do it. Yeah, you know, that's just a small example, but. I really believe compassion. If there's compassion, I won't have a gravestone anyway because I won't be lobbed in the sea and feed the crabs. But <laughs> if somewhere compassion may be writ large, then, then I'll be good. happy. Yeah, large. Team large. large. And, and um, final question before we do the two minute top tip. And um, that would be a, a book on leadership. That Apart from that excellent book, uh, Compassionate Leadership, <laughs> written by your good self, which I recommend to everybody. What would be another book that you've read recently that you go, great book. That's a really uh, profound one. Read that. I, I'm, I actually do read a lot. Um, I don't read sort of management self-help books. I, I read all sorts of different books. Um, I'm influenced a lot with sort of a lot of Buddhist sort of principles. I'm not a Buddhist. I, I, Have you found a good book on that? that area I, yeah well a couple from the Dalai Lama and, and he, he writes well and obviously with people which is great and it's a lovely one about the west see this this is a beautiful book right this one here the book of joy the teachings of the Dalai Lama and Desmond Tutu oh lovely yeah I had the, I've had the pleasure of, of having dinner with Desmond Tutu and that was an honor I haven't met the Dalai Lama yet I, I would love to nothing greater pleasure but in that principle the book of joy and there are two phenomenal people who have gone through extraordinary amount of their own right who think deeply about stuff but they're also hard hitters mm. not soft people no. and they weren't they never chose to take the easy line i mean doesn't treat you an extraordinary fellow so i this book I, I, is one that i, I bend over and and and, uh, and look a great deal right a book which has had a profound impact my work is daniel kahneman's think fast think slow book yeah and understanding more about the way our brain works because if we can understand how the brain works, because that's how it impacts the psychology, that impacts the behaviour, and then off we go. Yeah. Um, and there are two that stand out. For yeah, me. no, Kahneman, I, I would agree. Okay, thank you for that, Manny. Outstanding. Um, sadly, our time's come to an end, but we'll end with the two-minute top tip. So if you kindly, once again, introduce yourself um, and in a nutshell, the work you do now, and then leave them with your best top tip for them. Super. I'm Manly Hopkinson, the founder of the Compassionate Leadership Academy. I have the joy and pleasure of working with business leaders all over the world and community leaders too. My top tip is to have the courage to be you. 
firmly have that. Don't get distracted by external stimulus. Don't get distracted by false premise of what motivation or achievement might be, but have that awareness and courage to be yourself and live your own life. Manly, thank you very much indeed. You really do live the values that you espouse. Uh, and I found not only reading your book or listening to your book, but also talking today and on other occasions to be utterly inspiring. And I recommend people reach out and get help from you. So thank you once again. Jonathan, thanks a lot. Lovely to meet you. Lovely to talk. Keep one. Bye. Bye now.